very excited to announce our next speaker, uh, Leslie Hammersmith from the Young Survival Coalition of Champaign-Urbana. Uh, Leslie is the e-learning analyst at the Office of the Chief Information Officer at the University of Illinois. She has over 14 years of experience in higher education and faculty development in educational technologies. Leslie is trained in cancer research advocacy and is a patient advocate with Carl Cancer Center, where she reviews cancer research protocols. In 2009, Leslie was one of the founders of the Champaign-Urbana affiliate of Young Survival Coalition, the premier global organization dedicated to the critical issues unique to young women who are diagnosed with breast cancer. Under her leadership, YSCCU has grown to, to a recognized community organization to support young women facing breast cancer in central Illinois. Leslie has participated in programs from Research Advocacy Network and AACR Scientist Survivor Program and continues to pursue professional development and advocacy. So let's welcome Leslie. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me come here and coming the, in the late afternoon to listen. And to my friends who are here, I really appreciate that. <laughs> um, so I'm loosely affiliated, well not loosely, but very closely affiliated with the University of Illinois as an employee and with the Young Survival Coalition as an, one of our um, affiliate leadership members. Let's see if I can make this work. Okay, so there's my disclaimer, and I'm surprised that not more of you guys had this at the beginning of your PowerPoints because this is something I learned from going to ASCO and AACR and those big scientific meeting, so it's kind of my joke. But it really is true that this is, these are my opinions and not necessarily those of Young Survival Coalition or the University of Illinois or any researcher that I may talk about, which I won't hear, but anyway. I'm gonna skip over to my personal. This is actually, this slide here is my big excuse for putting my horse on here. <laughs> I'm a horse person, and uh, are there any other horse people? <sighs> Just cancer people, okay, I'll remember that. <laughs> Um, the, this picture is special to me because it represents for me what is very personal, a very personal relationship and connection that I have with my animal. It helped me heal through my cancer experience. Um, and so I wanted to start out by telling you that cancer becomes a very, is, it, it doesn't become, it is a very personal experience for anyone who's affected by it. Um, and that is a huge motivation for me to be up here right now and to do the things that I've done, to work with the people that I'm working with, uh, to make a difference in our community and hopefully for um, young women all over the world. Um, my personal history, my personal cancer history, has actually become a code for my identity, for how I fit into this complex ecosystem of cancer. And I was talking, I kind of joke, we joke with each other, when you meet another cancer survivor, you want to know all the details. You know, so my details, my deets, you know, I'm BRCA positive, I was diagnosed with um, triple negative breast cancer at the age of 36, uh, I had bilateral mastectomy with no reconstruction, and just by saying those words, not only my friends who uh, have gone through this experience, but my medical team, all of these implications about me and my future become a little bit clearer. Not as clear as I'd like them to be because I want to know exactly what are we targeting and how is that going to fix me, how is that going to affect the next person. But it's, it's this code that, um, that we speak once we're through diagnosis becomes our, our identity. And that is really significant. And, and I'll talk about that as we go on. And my personal story, my personal story, because I think there's a difference between your personal cancer history and your personal story with cancer. And my, my personal story has brought me to, again, this stage. Um, it's filled with all of these people. And, you know, I feel like I'm gonna cry now because these people mean so much to me. These are young survivors in Champaign-Urbana and their families and their friends and their caregivers. Every single person in this picture is affected by breast cancer for a woman who was diagnosed under the age of 45, some of them in their 20s, many of them in their 30s, some when they were pregnant with their children. Some of them, obviously you see they're young and they're vibrant and they're growing and they're, they have families. And, and so that gives my story meaning. By adding my story to their stories, we together can make a difference in what is happening, hopefully, all the way to the bench, all the way to what you're looking at. Those molecules under the microscope have a face. 
the things that you're doing, those nanotechnologies, that is exciting to me. I want to know, when is that coming and how is that going to affect, how is that going to help the person who's sitting next to me who does have bone mets that I would love to get in there with my own hands and just kill, you know, take it out. Go give me those nanoparticles so that we can put it there and save her life. And that's the face. Those are the faces. Young Survival Coalition is a na national organization. It was kind of a seed for bringing together all of these faces and creating this circle of support and bringing women and men and families together. It was also a vehicle for us to develop our voices so that we could go to our, our oncologists and um, researchers and let them know what are those issues that are unique to us. And when we're going through our treatment, this is true for many of us, not just me, but when we're going through our treatment, it feels like the, that our issues aren't really being met. You know, cancer, there, there's only like 10,000 cases of breast cancer diagnosed in women 40 and under a year. That's really small when you look at the whole, the numbers of cancer diagnoses. And we do have our particular issues, and so we, have a vehicle for starting to make those connections between survivors with our oncologists um, and with hopefully legislators and changing the law and, and this discussion we had earlier about health care and what our system and these atrocities that happen when, when people are sort of skipped over for reasons that shouldn't be there. This is where our voice starts. And this page here, this is our Facebook page. It's probably one of the most active pieces of our communication that we have right now. And I want to focus a little bit now on communication. You know, my background is in linguistics um, and in teaching English as a second language. It has nothing to do with science. Although when I was in seventh grade, they asked you, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I said I wanted to be a biologist. So somewhere inside me, there might be a little scientist that wishes they could be in the lab. And at AACR, I went there last year, and I kind of really dug all that equipment that was in the exhibit hall. So <laughs> there's a little bit of biology geek in me, I think. But, um, but really, language is important for me, and communicating, and how are we communicating to each other? Um, because it's important for us to be able to talk to our doctors so that when we go into their office, they are looking at us as an individual, as a person, and not so much as that statistic on the wall or that case study where the patient presents with such and such a disease and here are the steps that you go through. It's like we want to be seen as the person that we are. We want to be seen as that multidimensional being that's coming in your office that not only has a physical tumor or some other thing wrong with us, but we have psychosocial issues and we have financial issues. And well, the oncologist, it's not your job to really worry about our financial situations. You know, it's still, like our whole medical society, our whole, the whole healthcare system needs to recognize all aspects of that. And when a patient walks through the door, have something ready for them. And I think we're getting closer and closer. And in our community even, I noticed a difference with Mills Breast Cancer Institute and they've changed. And I'm not saying this is from me or from YSC or the women who are in this picture, but um, our voices were heard. And as every time I go into their office, there's something little new that happens that I'm like, wow, I was complaining about this four years ago and now they're actually doing something about it. <laughs> it takes that, it takes time everywhere, right? You know, like they, when we go in and get our, our um, what do they call it, the stats done, when you have your blood pressure taken and your temperature and the oxygenation in your blood and whatever, now they measure our arm that was affected by lymph, by, um, lymph node dissection. That just became part of the process for checking a patient in. And it's too late for me because I have lymphedema and they didn't catch it very early and I went through months and months of treatment and um, it's, it's a huge pain. But... You know, I told them, I'm like, look, you might be helping the next woman avoid some of the issues that I had to go through. And that's where our voices become really powerful in this. I mentioned AACR, so I just wanted to put, um, so this was like a little business card. I was part of the Scientist Survivor Program. This was part of my effort. You know, I, I think it's really important to be as educated as, as you possibly can if you want to be able to speak up. You know, it's hard to sit here and ask a question. <laughs> in a meeting when, when you really do only understand 65% or lower 
of the presentation that's going on, but you're trying really hard and your brain is crunching and you know, you're trying to make that connection with, well, this research is going to, if it goes in the way that you know, could happen, this is what it would look like once it's in the clinic. Um, and that is really exciting. But it takes a lot of work on the patient side to be able to get to that point where these things start making sense. And I kind of view a patient advocate and my role as being a translator. And to translate, because the language has a lot to do with it. Um, but translator, and I joked last night at dinner, I, you know, I'm like, sometimes we need to have a translator come with us into our oncologist's office to tell us what they're saying to us. Not only do we not hear them because we're in total shock half the time, but just so that we can start applying what they're saying to us in like real terms. And I said it jokingly, but as I listen to presentations, you know, I keep thinking that was we need to have, I know what you're saying, I know what you're saying, but I really wish that, that it could be translated into more common language. Um, and so that's kind of the role that I see of, of my education going, so that I have a better understanding in real scientific, authentic situations where I'm get, being paired with scientific mentors and understanding the, the biology and the basic science and the developments and what that meaning has so that when I come back to my community, I can help be that translator person. I don't have to push everybody into, hey, guess what you have to do? You have to go and start reading you know, cancer research and clinical trials and all these kinds of things, but to help them understand how it applies to them. And I think that is really key. It takes, like I said, it takes a lot of time. And I'm gonna share with you a couple of things that were my big motivation for putting a lot of energy into doing that particular piece of it. And these, these are, they're, they're important because they scare the crap out of me. And I am gonna add another one because Dan Heller's presentation, he um, had another scary thing for me to add. So I'll be adding that. But one of them is, this I found, the leading cause of cancer death in women ages 15 to 54 is a breast cancer, of all the cancers. The leading cause of cancer death. And I was diagnosed when I was 35, 36. And when the first time I saw that, I'm like, holy crap. <laughs> what does this mean? It means I'm gonna die? You know, so you, you see these things, you're like, oh my God, I have to do something about this. Um, what do I do other than get my treatment? Um, the second thing I saw, and this is from SEER data, that there's cancer survival rates, and we hear this over and over again, and it's a great media love to, to say this, that the, the um, survival rates have increased dramatically over the past 20 years. Oh, yeah, sure, it has, except for, you know, 30 to 34, 35 to 39. Why is there a dip? So that's changed a little bit now, but when I saw this and I was going through my treatment, it scared the crap out of me. I'm like, what is going on? How is this even possible that we're, that whole demographic is being ignored? And is it being ignored in the research? It just raised a lot of questions. And, and ultimately, I looked at this and, and, and I looked at the knowledge around me and I looked at what I could glean from my doctors and my medical teams and I just felt like there was a huge gap in what they could tell me. And so I just decided that what we're doing now is not working. It's not working if we're seeing huge gaps in our survival rates of invasive cancers over 20 years in one population segment. It's not working if we're waiting for lifetimes to have these breakthroughs happen. It's, just, it's not working. And so what can we as patients do to push that, those, these agendas forward, to accelerate this progress? And there's a lot of things that we can do, and I just chose one thing to talk about today um, because it's mostly connected with more of my linguistics and language background and communicating. And that is finding a way so that we're connecting the science to the patient or the, and the patient to the science or the scientist. And to do this better so that we understand why those gaps are and, the, and so that we can help communicate that these gaps and, the, and these scary things are really urgent matters for us. And we need to get that point across. So I'm looking at how do we do that? How do we start making it easier for our researchers to talk with the patient advocates? Because I hear a lot of people saying, oh yeah, we wanna, we wanna talk with the patient advocate, we wanna do this, and, 
And it doesn't happen so easily. It's not natural. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard to cross over. It's hard to be here, like I said, and to feel like you're an equal part when you're only understanding half of what you're looking at. But, but there are ways. And here's what I think. I think that if we look at some of these statistics from Q Internet American Life Project, going to just how Americans in general are starting to use technology to share information. Where are we getting our information? How are we using this, this technology in our hands? And how can we leverage these changes in our behavior and our expectations to increase the communication, the connection, and the understanding between the researchers, the oncologists, and the patients. So 83% of adults aged 33 and younger use social networks. Okay, we all figured that, right? But if you look at the, where did I put the little thing in my pocket? If you look at the little chart, which I know is really hard to see, there's a huge increase in older generations, a silent generation, age 65 to 73, huge increases are taking place. This is data from 2010, and it's huge, okay? Huge changes. So our, our behaviors are changing for what we're, how we're view, viewing these things. Every generation is increasingly getting news online. So not just our paper newspapers, but, no, oh, this is not working. But all of, the, all, of the, all of our generations, every generation has an increase in getting news online. This is any, this is any person who actually accesses the internet. Because okay? we know that there are also people who not only are not getting medical care, but they also don't have access to the internet and computers and cell phones and that type of thing. But, but it, this is really significant when you start thinking about your own behaviors. Of the internet users, eight and 10, are looking for health information online. That's a lot of people. It's the third most popular pursuit. And just look at that. Your email and going to a search engine are the top two, and then what's the next thing people are doing once they hop online? They're looking for health information. And that could be any kind of health information. That could be going to WebMD to see why your pancreas is killing you. Know, I don't know why they're you know, getting the hypochondriac person on there, but, but any kind of medical pursuit. And the devices that they're using are changing too. This is brand new data that just came out from, this is showing an increase from May 2011 to February 2012. So less than one year. And look at the percentage of owners of smartphones. 11% increase for smartphone owners. A decrease in regular cell phone owners and a little slight decrease in no cell phone. So you see where the trends are going in one year. And if you remember, let's see, what is the, there's a great statistic that took like, took nine years for a million users to get on AOL. It took nine months for a million users to join Facebook. And it took nine days for a million users to download, draw something on your cell phone. I mean, when you're looking at this change in behavior and devices and access, we have to start thinking about how information is being consumed and shared and interpreted by the, the individuals. So 17%, and actually this data is 2011 data, not the 2012 that we just saw. So this has probably even increased even more. 17% of cell owners have used their phone to look up health or medical information. So not just going to the library computer or their home computer, but using their cell phone. It's not much greater for 18 to 29 year olds. So as patients age, look at the behaviors that are following them coming closer. 9% of these cell phone owners have apps on their phones that help them track or manage their health. I have like four of them because I tried them, but, <laughs> but look how many at 18 to 29 year olds. 59% of Gen Yers, people born 1965 to 1983, would switch doctors for one with better online access. They just wouldn't go there anymore. If you can't give me my records online so that I can make appointments even, or look at my results, or you know, share that information with the people that I want to share it with, I'm not even going to bother going to your office. That's, that's major too. It's a major change. 
Does anybody have any questions on, on this before I go on? This is all of the, those are the, that's the data splurge that I have. Um, just our, our own behaviors and what we expect from our devices and where we're getting information. And just thinking of my own experience, you know, how do I become an educated patient and a patient advocate? You know, the, the research that I find online is really important. And not just the research that I'm finding online, but the communities that I can become a part of and be an equal member of that are helping me to stay current. So for example, using Twitter, uh, I didn't include the Twitter statistics. Twitter is like only 8% of internet users are actually using Twitter. It's a pretty small percentage, um, but almost twice that, actually, I think it's like 27% of Latino and African American um, Americans are using Twitter. So there's, there's some different demographics if you break down even what technologies people are using and why they're using them. But Twitter is a back channel at a conference, say at AACR or ASCO or something like that, is a place where a patient advocate can actually have a voice, ask questions, be in a session, maybe um, give a slightly different perspective. Here's what I'm thinking. You know, it's a good way to have that connection with a patient advocate without you know, causing everybody to come and travel to a certain city and, you know, they don't even have to be there. They don't even have to be at the conference to give that information. But I found that the Twitter back channels have helped me to create my network within a scientific community. Um, through, they have tweet ups. I don't have that. Do, are there any tweeters here? Anybody who's using it professionally? For your research? In your practice? So no eight percenters. Hmm. <laughs> I'm surprised that at least there's not at least one person here who's, who's used this before, even at a conference, or even followed the, the Twitter feed of a conference. Um, even beyond the conference, um, I have those people, I stay in their, in their community, and they, when a new study comes out or a new media item comes out, they help me give perspective on whether that is something that is foo-foo, <laughs> or if that's something that's serious. You know, I have my professional network right there. And so that is really important. That is really key. And I would encourage you guys, uh, especially the young folks, the young researchers, to start getting connected in those ways. Um, with, not just with patient advocates, but with each other. And there's a lot, there are a lot of resources out there for that. Um, so we've got about 20 minutes here, and I do want to leave some time to ask questions, so be thinking. So, but I wanted to share a couple of things. This is from, these are actual quotes that happen when the Young Survival, Survival Coalition comes together. We meet, we meet every month, um, and it's very casual. You all are invited, if you're in town, to go to Jupiter's at the Crossing on the last Tuesday of the month and meet us and have pizza and beer. And you can, you can hear real, raw stories. And, Sarah and Jay and Eric have all been there and they, they were, they've heard the raw stories and maybe we can hear some of those stories on the panel, I'm hoping. Um, but so I just thought I would give you a sneak of, of what I've heard people say at these meetings that, um, that some of them scared me. Like I wouldn't do a clinical trial because I want to guarantee that the treatment they give me will do something. I mean, talk about this conception about what a clinical trial is and does. And when that came up, there are several of us that have gone through clinical trials, have benefited greatly from being a part of a clinical trial. And so we had the opportunity to talk with that person and tell them the real experience of what a clinical trial does, that you know, they're not going to, <laughs> to give you a placebo and let you continue on. You know? So it's real educational opportunities. Um, this is very common. I never saw anyone my age during, tr during treatment. Uh, I think that's the whole reason Young Survival Coalition was established to begin with. This one, I wanted to punch this surgeon in the gut when I heard somebody say that. They were like, my surgeon said lymphedema is just an annoyance. And as a lymphedema sufferer, it's more than annoyance, especially when you're 36 years old and you expect to live another 50 years with this. I had to insist that they do more tests on my lump because they didn't believe that it would be breast cancer, that they weren't giving me the answers that, that I thought I needed to have. And when they did more tests, they, lo, lo and behold, it wasn't just a lump. It was actually a tumor that needed serious follow-up. So that's scary that that happens. And these, these are not old quotes. We've been around since 2009. And so these were collected in 2009. I don't know what my options are after a mastectomy. 
you know, that's another issue. And we're, when you're, we are, happen to be in Champaign-Urbana, which is a really wonderful city. We're really blessed to have the University of Illinois and such great medical um, options. But we don't have every single specialist that exists living and working in the Champaign-Urbana area. And so sometimes when you go um, and have a consult, you're only being consulted about the things that are offered in that particular office. So half of us don't even know that there are other options for certain types of reconstruction or you know, even other kinds of treatments. So that is a really serious. So part of what we do is make sure that we are sharing options and, and bringing education to this area. My husband doesn't know who to talk to. That happens a lot too. Or they need to talk and yeah, there really is not a good place, comfortable place for them to go. So, so these are, those are just some snippets. Um, of what we have heard in our meetings from the patient. In response to this too, um, the Young Survival Coalition, this will be our second year doing this. Um, in November, two, uh, third, on November 3rd, 2012, uh, we're putting together a symposium. Uh, it's for cancer patients and thrivers, medical professionals. You know, we would love, we have oncologists there. Uh, we want to have the whole strata of people who are involved with cancer um, and cancer treatment diagnosis to, to be here. And we invite all of you to come. It's 10 bucks, it includes lunch. We have speakers from all over the place coming. Um, if you're interested in, in being a speaker, you know, let us know too, we would love that. And that's all that I have prepared as sort of a background from a patient perspective. The impetus for taking your personal cancer history and your personal story and making it into something bigger than is just yourself. And then reflecting on what it's like to be that patient who is, has a foot in the scientific area, who really wants to see change and wants to support the research that's going out there. Um, and seeing these huge communication challenges. I hope that it's given you something to think about as you go home and phone your significant others or text them or look at Wikipedia to find out what the heck the next speaker is talking about. <laughs> because these have serious impacts on all parts of our lives and not just in cancer, but for some, that's something that we can all manage. We can all look at how we're using these devices, how we're communicating with each other and make an effort to connect in ways that are accessible to all of us. So, any questions? Yeah, yeah, that, that's true. I, I think clinical trials are incredibly important. And that's, and I, like, I was a beneficiary of a clinical trial that I am so glad that I was part of. Um, and we do have, when we get a, a new person come in and they start talking about the treatment, there are several of us who ask, well, did they talk to you about this? And if they're being treated at certain um, hospitals in the area especially, we know that they probably haven't been talk, you know, they don't bring it up because all they offer is a standard of care. Um, I know Jen wants to say something. <laughs> She'll answer. She's a good person. <laughs> I'm Jen Smith and I'm uh, very excited to be involved in this panel um, and we'll share a little bit more about my story. Um, clinical trials. I am stage four. I would love to be in a clinical trial. I spend my days making phone calls, doing research online, looking up possible clinical trials, and I'm turned down for a lot of them because either I'm too heavily pre-treated, I'm on my 16th treatment, 
um, or I have had um, I didn't have enough time between the original uh, chemotherapy and the recurrence chemotherapy. I had 364 days, and I, I had to be one year out, so I've been turned down because of that. I've been turned down because although I have exceptional insurance, they won't pay for standard of care costs even if the drugs are provided free. Um, so there are issues that go beyond just wanting to do the clinical trial. There are so many people that I know that would love to have that option, um, but can't afford standard of care costs or risking losing insurance because you're trying to do a clinical trial. So I, I would hope that um, in the future researchers are able to do clinical trials and offer complete coverage for participants in those trials. Yeah. I have a comment about that. We, we deal with this at, at our cancer center. We probably have about 100 or 120 clinical trials open at a given time, and the ways new ones are coming online and offline. Uh, we try to have a broad portfolio available for patients at every stage of disease. And the thing that we have to sort of turn the public and the insurance companies head around to is to think about in many cases, um, it would be that after a certain treatments that you've been through, you've been through the standard of care. Now the standard for you would be investigational therapy. What I would say, not experimental, investigational. This is not. Uh, we're trying to find um, out if the drugs will work for you, if they will work for others, uh, but it is, an ex it is an expensive procedure. Uh, Medicare is actually, uh, interestingly, is obliged to pay for the standard of care for clinical trials, but commercial insurance is not. Perhaps in Massachusetts there are... Uh, <laughs> we don't know the answer to that. I, I will say that we... Try to augment. We often have a study that's a, a drug company sponsored study. It's kind of interesting that uh, our friends at pharmaceutical companies really we take a look at what it costs us to mount these trials, our regulatory fees, which are always going up. Um, the extra time that the physicians and staff have to spend, have to and need to spend with you to explain the trials costs money. Uh, what we end up doing a good deal of time is we end up putting hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars of philanthropic money into our clinical trials enterprise just to be able to get these trials out to you. We have to make choices, we can't do it all the time. But again, um, many cancer centers, they have a NCI Cancer Center uh, grant that pays part of the clinical trials office, but that's only maybe a third of the cost. We're putting a lot of money into the enterprise. Um, criteria, though, are, are often strict because Part of it is the idea of doing no harm. Uh, part of it is due to sometimes trying to commercial concerns of companies. Uh, they want to hear that their drug is fairly tested and if some adverse event occurs, it's uh, really not due to someone else's drug that was in your system or something like that. But there are, those are reasonable concerns because at the end of the day, they're, they're uh, interest in yours coincide because they would like to bring a new drug to treat what you have. So they'd like to do sort of a, um, they don't want, they want to be sure nothing else gets in the way. But I, I hear what you're saying and I want to assure you that many of us in the uh, basic and clinical research communities in cancer are doing the best we can um, with some diminishing uh, resources. I would say we have nationally funded, uh, NCI funded clinical trials groups that they're encouraging us to, to offer, to bring more patients into trials, but they're cutting our per patient fees, such that you know, it's costing, they're, they're, the government's giving us one third of the cost for really what it costs. What can you do? I suggest that you um, advocate for a healthcare system that you feel is the right one. I'm not gonna tell you what that is, so <laughs> you know. Um, and I suggest that you advocate for an increased uh, federal funding of research of every type in cancer as an investment in our national security, investment of our future, which I see here with all the trainees here, and uh, an investment in our economic growth. So in every which way, the uh, NIH budget, the National Science Foundation budget, uh, the Department of Energy budget, these are the edges of growth of our country. 
And this is where we should be spending money to help us out of this terrible recession mm -hmm. the past several years and to offer some new hope for people like yourself. I agree. And I just saw um, this week the breakdown of the U.S. budget and only 2% of the entire U.S. budget is going to cancer research, to all cancer research. 2% goes to education as well. 20% is going to defense, 20% to social security, you know, and, and those projects. So when you look at those programs and, and the amount of money that's actually going into that, it was uh, exactly, we need to be putting our voices out there to get that funding. So. I think if you, to just one comment on the patient recruitment issue, it's kind of related in a way to this very graphic presentation we had right before that got my goat, but um, that patients just don't understand what, what it means, not, not necessarily that, it's a, that there's placebos involved or what have you, but what, they don't understand the science, they don't understand that it's important, and most of the time they want to just be reassured that they're getting the treatment, they trust their doctors. Many, many patients don't even question the treatment that the doctors are recommending. This is relative, if you, if you talk to oncologists right now, the ones that I've talked to, it's more becoming, it's generational. This questioning back, and I think that, that goes back to a little bit of what I was talking about with the access to this information too, and that we're able to do our own research, maybe not understand it all, but we're able to get online. And so there are sites out there like breastcancertrials.org where they do a really great job of breaking that that clinical trial protocol down into real language and say this is what's happening, this is what you need to do to qualify for this. And so having those kinds of resources, but most people don't even know that those things exist. And so there's communication gaps all around. And it's very, very expensive, as was brought up, to take a patient through that process. So. Absolutely. To change the, the NSF budget and everything, and also um, allocate where the where the federal uh, funds go to research. Um, there, yeah, there are a ton answer. of places for that, as you know, being a very active person. No, not you. Who I was talking to, Freddie. That's who I was sitting next to. He is very active, and we we had a long discussion about One Voice Against Cancer as a group that is a takes a lot, multiple charity, nonprofit organizations, um, and they go to, to Washington and they have lobby days. National Breast Cancer Coalition also has lobby days where they train um, breast cancer patient advocates and research advocates and then do lobby days uh, at, in Washington. Are they pretty effective? They are, you know, change takes a lot of time. I asked Freddie this last night too. I'm like, well, have you seen any changes? He's done this a couple of years now. He's like, well, it takes a long time. But knowing that if you're not in that office with that congressman telling them what's important, then somebody else is going to be sitting there and who knows what they're telling them is important. You know, so you have, that's one place for our voice and the more that you go to Washington, the more you're talking to your legislators, your congressmen, and developing that relationship so that they trust what you're saying, they trust your organization, they trust you as an individual, you're going to start seeing that. I mean, it takes lots of voices to make that happen, yeah. But what is the lack of of, uh, of change or the uh, or the pace and change? I mean, is it there's just not no? You know, I had words, Freddie. We should do a whole panel just on that because that is there are so many. We brought up several. I mean, funding. If the if the government is not funding this, if the government is constantly is taking NCI funding away in a time when we really need to put it, be putting it into that into NCI. You know, that we have a problem. But there are problems also in the reward system for where research is taking place, what's being rewarded. Um, I probably shouldn't go into that here. I think we should, that would be a good idea for next year <laughs> to have a panel kind of talking about that. So. <laughs> curious, uh, I really appreciate what you're saying about patients needing to get more informed using social media, uh, getting that information. Does that translate at all into patients not only advocating for cancer research, but for advocating what type of cancer research, what type of projects to um, put more money into? Because 
you know, the cancer research community is so huge. Um, could that be another dimension to this to this movement? Absolutely, and I think that happens in, with, you know, I hate to bring up the devil right now, but the Susan G. Komen Foundation uses social media quite a bit to contact their constituents and sign petitions for certain directions in cancer research. And so social media is used as a way to show support. I think people like this because there's minimal effort on their side to go and put their email on a list. So there's, there are some downsides to social media, I think, in terms of being real activist tools. Um, I think I think you can be, get a great perspective, and this is, you know, I'm not, I might be stepping out of my own experience realm a little bit, but just from my, from using Twitter on my own to, to understand what is going out there, what is important to the real f people in the field, um, I get a better understanding of the directions, their opinions, p opinions that I respect because I've grown to know them and I know that they're respected in their own communities. Um, so that helps me, as I, I think I hinted to this bef before, uh, there was a, a media outlet. So the media, they take these these research discoveries that are so out that that shouldn't even be making it to the paper, and suddenly it becomes this big hope for everyone. And I remember something about blueberries and mice. That it was a it was a study with six six mice, six mice, and the media had this like, oh look at this! If you have blueberry extract, it's going to prevent cancer. Blah blah blah. And I'm like, are you kidding me? And people. People on Facebook were passing this around. I'm like, wait, wait, wait a second. Read what is act what this really is. You know, go into the study and read what they're doing. Six mice is a good indication that maybe that's something that right that maybe somebody would pick that up as more for you know as for the research. But in terms of saying that's going to do anything for a human being is a huge stretch. So I think in a way, social media, but the outlets, the media outlets have to be really. Re they, we need more responsibility from them too in how they're reporting this. The scientific reporters. Yeah. Okay, at this time we're going to transition into our panel discussion. So let's thank Leslie again for the